Welcome to the Passive Income Podcast. I am your host, Dividend Dave. Please be sure to join the Passive Income Posse by clicking that subscribe button below. Super excited for this episode. Joining me is Daniel. Daniel has over 213,000 YouTube subscribers on his channel. Uh, So right away, Daniel, uh, maybe you don't need an introduction, but please go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, I am Daniel Pronk. I am a, I guess, a YouTuber that I I actually live up in Canada as well. I'm from Calgary. Calgary, right? Yeah, I'm from Calgary, Alberta. And my channel is very focused on long-term fundamental investing and the investment principles of Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, Peter Lynch. And that's pretty much what I try to discuss and talk about on my YouTube channel is just the investment principles and uh, long-term investing and a lot of dividend stocks as well. So I feel like I'm in a safe place here. <laughs> you, you definitely are. Uh, myself, my audience, we we love our dividends, uh, whether they roll in, you know, monthly or quarterly. It's uh, it, it's just awesome to see that, you know, into your brokerage account. It's like, hey, there's another five dollars, ten dollars, fifty dollars, a hundred, whatever it happens to be, right? Wherever you are in your investing journey, even people that you see, oh, I got my very first dividend of nine cents, and you're just like, that is awesome, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> It's amazing how quickly the dividend snowball really gets going. You know, at the beginning, it's anywhere from, you know, five to two bucks. And then over the next few years, it can really get up into the $50, $100 range. A yeah. few more years, you know, you could be making $1,000 a month in dividends. So exactly. it's very motivating to watch. Exactly. Yeah. No, I couldn't agree more. Um, definitely, uh, like I said, definitely, uh, like you said, in a, in a safe space. Safe <laughs> space with with all the uh the dividend investors i i know there's a lot of back and forth on twitter uh slash x with uh you know the total growth investors sort of almost like versus the, it sometimes it <laughs> turns into a like twitter fight so of like <laughs> anyways we'll, we'll we'll let that one go <laughs> yeah i i don't really try to invest in you know, a business just because it pays a dividend or not. Right. I think a good example would be alimentation, Kustard. Exactly. That yep. business, I think, is just incredibly high quality. Yeah, it pays out about a 1% dividend. And maybe they could be getting a higher return if they had that money reinvested back into the business. But I mean, if you take a look at that stock's history of returns, it's, it is absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. So yes, it pays a dividend, but that doesn't mean that it can't outperform the S&P 500 or give you incredible results over the long term. So I don't really understand that whole argument too much, to be honest. I don't understand it either. It's like, why can't I have both? Why can't I have dividends and and capital appreciation? And I, and I think, uh, like you just said, ATD is a great example of that, right? Unfortunately, I do not own that one. I, I, I wish I did so many stocks, (laughs) as you know, you can't buy them all, right? It's not Pokemon. You can't, you can't catch them all. Um, so (laughs) that's, that's exactly right. Yep. Um, and, and there's so many that I would love to have, but I just, you know, at the end of the day, you can't, you can't buy everything. And that is definitely one that, uh, it would be nice to have if you do have it in your, in your portfolio hats off to you, because exactly like you just said, you know, it's growing, it has a little dip, bit of a dividend, a, a one or 1.5% yield. That's nice. You get a little bit, you know, something, a little bit of cash in hand and it's all good. But like you said, wow, just just look at the return it, it's provided over the last 5, 10, 15 years. Yeah, it's it's an incredible <laughs> business for sure. And one thing I've noticed too about ATD in specific, but a lot of those dividend companies that pay, you know, 1% or sub 1% dividends, is they also tend to grow that dividend quite rapidly. Right. I believe ATD has grown its dividend by over 20% over the past decade. Sorry, a 20% annual growth rate over the past decade. Wow. Which means which means it's doubling every three to four years. Yeah. So it may be a 1% dividend right now, but you know, in 20 years, it could be 10% yield on cost, which is pretty good. Yeah. That's another very important point, the yield on cost, right? If your dollar cost averaging in over the, over your accumulation phase of say five or 10 or 15 years, then 20 years down the road, your yield on cost is looking pretty, pretty sweet. (laughs) Yeah, that's, that's something I focus on too in my portfolios. What is the yield on cost going to be of my investments within the next decade, 20 years, things like that. Now, and you look quite young as well. So it looks like you have a lot of time on your on your side and the 
and we all know the benefits of of compound interest over time. So I, I'm guessing, you know, getting into this at, at a younger age, you're definitely at that stage of like, hey, where am I going to be? Like I just said, in, in that 15 to 20, even 25 years down the road, you know, I see you nodding your head. So you're yeah. just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, I have the luxury of time. But the funny thing is, I, I wish I started when I was 15 or younger, honestly. Like, right. I wish my parents got me investing when I was 10 years old. I would have, you know, would have been so much further ahead right now, but it is what it is. You can't go back. <laughs> no, and exactly. And I, that's a great point. And I, I, again, going back to Twitter slash X, I do see some of those posts of parents saying, Hey, I've, I'm starting investing for my one-year-old or five-year-old or eight or 10-year-old or whatever it happens to be. And yeah, those kids are, are getting set up quite well, but at the same time, you know, you or me, we can't look back and, and blame our parents for for not investing and, and again that goes back to financial literacy right like maybe they didn't know yeah. and maybe like maybe we still don't know right yeah exactly it's 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 not worth the time to reminisce on the past or regret not investing sooner it's just got to look forward yeah exactly that i couldn't have said it better myself like um i i love the saying you can't unring that bell meaning you can't, you can't basically meaning you can't go back on time in time you can't change things that have happened in the past and yeah, just focus on the future, right? Focus on on the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years, whatever your time horizon uh, happens to be. Yep, yep, exactly. So I, I'm curious, actually, do you only invest in dividend stocks with your name being Dividend Dave? Uh, I have I have one in my portfolio that is uh, not a dividend stock, and it is a uh, standard lithium. And it's basically, I bought that thinking... And it, and it has worked out too. Um, obviously, the lith the amount of lithium going into uh, uh, batteries in EV cars, electric vehicles, that's sort of my uh, my one outlier that does not pay a dividend. But more or less, yeah, everything else. I whether it's a a, a a single company or an ETF or index fund or anything else I have in my portfolio, they all pay a dividend. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, I, I, and again, it, it, it's a bit of it is the psychology, right, of just seeing that that money, that cash, show up in your brokerage account. Um, I'm guessing you you probably use Wealth Simple as well, being in Canada, that um, you just see it show up there every month, every quarter. There's just another five, ten, twenty, fifty, thirty, whatever, however, whatever the dollar amount is, a hundred dollars. There it is, and it, and it adds up, right? It adds up real quick. Again, going back to your point of the snowball effect, suddenly you've got every month you've got another hundred dollars to to buy more dividend, to buy more stocks that pay a dividend, right? So, so you do uh, reinvest your dividends then, hey? Do you definitely? Yeah. Do you reinvest the dividend into the same place you got it, like with the drip program, or do you get that cash then? No, buy I, stocks? I I do it manually. Um, so as I. I I'm guessing again. I'm, do you use Wealth Simple? I actually do not. No. Oh, okay. So Wealth Simple just recently, like within the last, I want to say three or four months, maybe six months, somewhere in that time frame, has uh, started offering uh, Drip as in like automatic uh, dividend reinvestment plan. But always before that, and even now, still to this day, I I manually reinvest them, and part of that reasoning is that i like to dollar cost average down on everything <laughs> yeah so i'll take you know i'll take 20 dollars from rio can and 20 dollars from someone else from pizza pizza that i'm up on and i'll take that 40 dollars and maybe buy hydro one that i i can dollar cost average down or something like that like that's just a, a random wild example but uh but yeah all the dividends do get reinvested at this point yep i am the exact same way I get my dividend income. I probably do it once every two weeks or once every, well, really whenever there's dividend income that comes into the portfolio. And then at that moment, I try and look at, okay, well, where do I think this money is going to be best invested? And then right. place it that way. I I don't have any drips in my portfolio either. Yeah. I, I kind of do it a weird way because I, I get, I have a day job. I get paid bi-weekly every, every second Thursday. And then, so I kind of, you know, I, I take my pay myself first uh mentality out of whether i 
you know, obviously some paychecks that you've got more bills to pay and mortgage to pay and insurance and all of those fun things. So whether it's a hundred or 200 or $300 that I'm taking out of my paycheck and then I'm like, okay, well, my paycheck was on the 14th, but I'll have more dividends on the 16th. So I'll like transfer the money on the 14th, but then wait a couple of days till the dividends. And then I have more money to just sort of do a, a like a block buy, I guess is what you would call it. Right. Like, Yeah, that makes sense. Right. Yeah, definitely. I, I am very interested in some of the sectors that you invest in. Um, I, I guess maybe first off, what is one of the bigger positions in your portfolio? Like just throwing that out there. Yeah. So my largest currently is Brookfield, Brookfield's corporation. Do you know, Anthony, Anthony loves you just all right. <laughs> we're into the, not even the 11 minute mark and Anthony newcomer investor has just fallen in love with you. Oh yeah. Yeah. Newcomer investor. That guy is great. We get along well. <laughs> yeah, he's been on here, uh, I, I think, three times now. He's been on uh, twice, one-on-one -on -one like this, and he's also been on a live stream. And yeah, Anthony and I have some really good uh, back and forth. I, I really like Anthony, and he is the absolute biggest cheerleader for Brookfield. <laughs> yep, I, I follow him quite a bit on Twitter. He has a lot of good insights. Yeah, definitely, for sure, so... Uh, yeah. So Brookfield being your biggest position, uh, I, I guess like <laughs> beyond just doing what Anthony has told you to do and buy more, <laughs> sort of, I guess, <laughs> what is your, what is your reasoning? And obviously they're a great company. And, and again, that's uh, going back to Kush Tard, that's one that I don't own, but I wish I, I would love to have them in my portfolio, but I just, I just can't buy everything. Right. So. Yeah. Brookfield. I think that it's just a very complex business. And I mean, I have close friends who all invest quite like they're very into investing. They love analyzing stocks and they've taken a look at Brookfield and they're just like, no way. I don't care how cheap this stock is. Like, it's just too much. I do not want to sit down and spend like two weeks researching one stock to maybe buy it or not. So a lot of people, I think, just don't even, you know, really dive into Brookfield and the value that it can offer just due to its complexity, which I also think is totally fair. Right. Um, you should definitely not buy anything if it's too complex for you or you're going to be uncomfortable holding it or you don't really know why you're why you're holding it in the first place so it's it's just one of those stocks that you know the, the complexity can hold it down at times but i also think that that can create an opportunity for those who are willing to do the research and really dive into it and potentially understand the business right. because you know i if you if you trust the management that stock is trading for about 10 times FFO right now, funds from operations. And it's projected to grow FFO at 25% per year over the next five years. Wow. So you're you're basically paying a 10 multiple for 25% annual growth, which in the stock market, I don't see. So to me, that that's the main reason that it's become my largest position. If it goes up, you know, or sorry, I should say that if it were double the price today, it probably wouldn't be as large of a position, right. but just the price versus growth that they're going to achieve over the next five years, I think is just a very unique opportunity. So I, I've gone in a little bit big. <laughs> and that is just ticker symbol BN, it is correct? Yep. Because they also have ticker sim symbol BAM, uh, Brookfield Asset Management. Then there's BEP, which I believe is that the renewables. And then, it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, is BIP another one? Because they have this whole umbrella under that under that main BN. Uh, and, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, but. Nope, nope, you're correct. Um, yeah, so BN is the corporation. They're like the mother company. Right. And then BIP, BEP, um, Brookfield Business Partners, Brookfield Insurance, those are all subsidiaries of Brookfield Corporation, BN. And they really just list those companies to give people optionality on what they want to invest in. And it's also a good idea for Brookfield Corporation, the mother company, to do that because they can buy and sell their own subsidiaries when they believe they are undervalued or overvalued. So it kind of gives the corporation more optionality with the shares as well to capitalize on what the public markets are doing. But yeah, it's complex. There's a lot of, there's a lot going on there. <laughs> yeah, and, and uh, there was just a recent video on your channel about Brookfield, correct? Just I, I was actually watching that just... Um 
yesterday or the day before. So, um, yeah, I, I will I mean, obviously link your channel in the description below. So it'll be very easy to find that that video if anyone would like to uh, learn more about Brookfield. If if Anthony doesn't subscribe to your channel yet, you <laughs> you just got two hundred and thirteen thousand and one <laughs> because of that Brookfield video. <laughs> yeah, I make. I make a lot of Brookfield content. I don't see a lot of people talking about Brookfield on YouTube. So I think I'm slowly becoming like the Brookfield guy on YouTube. A lot of people subscribe to me just for those videos. <laughs> wow. That's, that's uh, incredibly niched down, right? <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Okay. Awesome. Uh, let's move along. And I want to kind of bring up uh, another relatively hot topic it's i guess sort of a hot and cold topic it's uh canadian banks what are your thoughts obviously they've been paying dividends uh you know since moses was a boy and <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I guess do you invest in canadian banks uh if so which ones do you like or are there any that you don't like or yeah just i'll, I'll let you take it from there yeah i definitely invest in canadian banks um my partner over at Stock Unlock actually makes fun of me because I own, I, I think at the peak of my portfolio being invested in banks, I had eight different banks in my portfolio. I've cut that down a little bit. But yeah, I, I like were those the Canadian, all Canadian banks because we only have eight banks here. <laughs> no, no, they were not all the Canadian banks. I don't, there's a few Canadian banks that I personally don't invest in, but um, the large ones like Royal Bank, National Bank, TD Bank. Those three, I think, are incredibly solid companies. Yeah. Um, TD has been paying a dividend, I believe, for 160 years consecutively. And they've been able to grow that dividend at, I don't know the exact compounded annual growth rate over the past 20 years, but they just yeah. they just continue growing that dividend and continue growing it. So I think that there's a lot of fear in the banking sector right now, especially with the commercial real estate worries that everyone has. Yeah. But I mean... I think I believe, not just commercial real estate, any real estate, right? With yeah. the, the way interest rates have been just skyrocketing and people are really, really, myself included, kind of afraid, what's going to happen when I have to renew my mortgage? And I, I'm going from 2.9 to maybe 6%. Like, yeah, that's that's going to hurt. I'm not going yeah, to lie, not, right? It's not going to be fun. My mortgage renews next year as well. And I'm at 2.8 right now. So that, that yeah. it's not going to be fun. <laughs> no, not at all. <clears throat> but yeah, it's... In my opinion, it's just, you know, these large banks have been around for over 100 years. They did not yeah. fail during the financial crisis. I don't think that the worst case scenario, what we could see over the next few years is going to be anywhere close to the financial crisis. So I, I think they're going to get through it. Yeah. And I plan on just holding them for hopefully the rest of my life. Yeah. So I'm I'm really only going to be looking to buy if they go down more. I'm, not, I'm really not looking to sell any, any of the Canadian banks. They're some of the best banks in the world. So yeah, definitely. Yeah, no reason. Uh, same. I have a very small position in TD. Just kind of bought a couple shares recently. Um, I've been trying to dollar cost average into Bank of Nova Scotia this year. Um, I, I know people kind of have different opinions on on sort of BNS and, and CIBC, but again, they're in the big five Canadian banks, and I feel you, you can't go too wrong. And, you know, Bank of Nova Scotia has been paying a, a dividend since. I believe it's 1832 or maybe 1833. So, you know, like 40 years before Canada even became a country. Right. So, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. And our, I mean, Canada's population is also growing quite significantly right now. So exactly. I, I think more and more people are going to continue using Canadian banks. I also think that Canada absolutely needs to build more housing. Yeah. And, and when Canada builds more housing, because eventually I think I think it's an inevitability at this point that they're going to have to really ramp that up. Yeah. And when they and when they do, that's going to be millions more homes that people are going to need mortgages for. And they're going to go to the, you know, Canada's largest banks to get Yeah, them. whether it's Royal or or BM like Bank of Montreal or CIBC or T D or or whichever bank they go to, National Bank, like all of exactly. those like you said, a million more homes, that's basically a million more mortgages, right? Yep. Exactly. I, I, I can't argue with that logic <laughs> at all. <laughs> yeah. So I think that there's long term tailwinds in Canada that will, you know, get these businesses through whatever short term headwinds we face. Yeah. 
I think that's a great point. And just, I, you know, the longevity of, of the, the big five, and now you can definitely include national as, as in the big six. They're really, 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 for me, in my opinion, again, not financial advice, but they're really, really difficult or tough to bet against, right? Yeah, I would agree with that for sure. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Um, another sector that I uh, want to um, kind of dive into a little bit, it, it's it's a sector I got into sort of when I was sort of more starting out my dividend investing journey. And the reason I got into a lot of REITs was because they paid a monthly dividend and I thought that was very attractive. Now, I, I, I mean, I get it at the end of the day, say, you know, a 5% yield is 5%, whether if it's, that's annualized. So whether that's paid monthly or, or quarterly, it, it's not really any different, but I, I guess maybe it's a little bit of the, the psychology of seeing that money show up in your account every 30 days. And also, also, you know, sort of the part of the dividend investing strategy is to be able to eventually someday ha have enough dividends to pay your, your monthly bills. So that was sort of another one of my, uh, I guess, I, again, when I got into the dividend investing strategy, sort of one of my initial ideas. So yeah, REITs like, uh, Rio can smart center and so many others in Canada and any, any thoughts on REITs? Do you have any, do you invest in any, do you, do you like the sector, dislike the sector? And again, this kind of ties back into the uh, Canadian banks with the, the higher interest rates too, because REITs have been hammered with higher interest rates. Um, uh, again, sorry, I, I'm rambling. I'll let you take over there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I hold a couple REITs, but I am very specific on the ones that I hold, I really want strong balance sheets, not a lot of debt, because right now we're kind of in a point where if if a REIT has a bad balance sheet, then it's not going to be in a good position. Right. And we've kind of seen that. There's a few REITs in Canada that are down, I believe something like 80, 80 oh, 70 yeah. to 80%. Oh yeah, Northwest Healthcare has ha been hammered. Yep. Uh, TNT, which is True North, they've been hammered. Yep. Yep. And it's, it's because those businesses do have a lot of debt. Now these higher interest payments are eating into the cash flow. So I do my best to focus on those REITs that are well financed, don't have too much debt and will be able to handle higher interest rates and get by just fine. Now, what's interesting about the REIT sector is, well, any sector really, is when there is bearishness towards a sector, the entire thing tends to sell off. Right. So the entire real estate sector will sell off which actually happened, I think it was in 2022 at some point, but for example, industrial REITs in Canada, Dream Industrial, which is the one that I own, right. it sold off from, I think, 17 down to 10 with the entire REIT sector. But I was taking a look at every fundamental metric, the cash flows, revenue, and everything, and every metric was still going up. So I was like, this is looking kind of like a really good opportunity because there's a lot of fear but when you take a look under the hood, this business is actually doing just fine. Right. And it's still doing just fine today. It's still record cash flows, record revenue, record everything. So I think that when an entire sector sells off, it can create diamonds in the rough and you can find opportunities if you kind of take the time to to find them and know what you're looking for. Yeah, that's a great point. You know, finding those diamonds in the rough. If, if you can do it, hats off to you because, and, and it does take, you know, some extra time and uh, due diligence, do your own research, all of that fun stuff that you hear all of us say all the time. But if yep. you're doing it and you find those diamonds in the rough, then that's great, right? Because that's exactly what you want to do. You don't want to just be, you know, following, following the crowd. Yep, absolutely. One of, one of the REITs that I also bought was True North after they, uh, they fell down below three bucks. I was like, Okay, this is this dividend yield is around thirteen percent now. Like that's enough for a very small position for me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that one's that's probably my my littlest position in my entire portfolio. But I did pick up some of that one. It's just like a let's see what happens. Yeah. So I, I own True North uh, as well. Ticker symbol TNT dot UN on the TSX, and I I've lived through the dividend cut. You know I. I thought I was being smart during COVID buying that. I was thinking, oh, okay, offices aren't going to be empty forever. Eventually, people are going to go back to the office. Uh, they they le rent and lease primarily to to governments. I'm like, 
the government's always going to pay, whether it's a provincial government or federal government or whoever, like they're always going to pay their lease of their monthly rent. So I, I was looking at it going, this is a, you know, a, a good buying opportunity back in, I guess I want to say sort of 2021 in that sort of time frame. And yeah, it did really well through 2021 and into 2022, like every other stock did, right? <laughs> and we had yeah. a really yeah. good bull run there. And I was feeling really good about myself thinking, wow, I'm, I'm so smart for buying that when offices were empty. And then 2023 happened and yeah, they, you know, they, the, the stock price itself is tanked. The, the dividend uh, was cut literally in half 50%, I believe. So, yep. uh, but I still hold that I, um, again, it's not a huge position. I, I'm not, I, I have over a hundred shares, maybe 150 170 max but um you know even even with the 50 the percent cut I, i'm still getting a dividend rolling in every month so i'll take it right yep <laughs> yeah it's that's going to be an interesting one for sure i'm really interested to see how that one plays out because yeah, i cut... agree i believe it i believe it has a great opportunity to, uh, to bounce back sorry for interrupting you there oh no that's okay yeah it's well they cut the dividend to basically free up 25 million dollars of annual cash flow right and i did the math on the interest payments for their average interest payment on their leases right now versus current interest rates and i believe that if they refinance their portfolio their interest payments would go up by something like seven million dollars wow. so that would still mean that they have an extra 18 million left over and now they're they're starting to buy back shares too now so it's like I wonder if that dividend will be increased again in the future at some point. Yeah, I'm sure it will. It, it, you know, again, you look at some of these, like I, I've lived through a few dividend cuts in the last, uh, say, 12 to 16 months. And I'm looking at them going, I really think some of these have a have a good chance to to reverse. Actually, that's a great segue into uh, the energy sector and utilities sector, uh, Al Algonquin Power. I, I've lived through that dividend cut. Uh, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, Algonquin is one of the stocks that I have always avoided. <laughs> uh, I was not comfortable with how that business was growing. They used a lot of debt and yeah. a lot of a lot of uh, issuing shares. So if you actually take a look at the per share metrics of that business, like revenue per share, operating cash flow per share, EBITDA per share, mm -hmm. over over the I think it was the past decade, it was actually flat because they would issue shares to grow. So on a per share basis, they weren't actually creating any value and they were taking on a ton of debt to do it. And where the stocks returns came from was actually a lot of multiple expansion. So the, the market was essentially pricing the stock higher and higher and higher. And then. But the value got, wasn't really there for that higher price. Yeah. In my opinion, on a per share basis, I was like, it's not actually creating any value. People are just buying up the stock and making the price go higher. And I didn't think that it would last forever. Right. And you were um, right. It didn't last forever. <laughs> yeah, I I mean, yeah, I don't know what's going to happen to that business. It is definitely on my radar. It's something I have on my watch list. But I want to see what happens. I'm not quite sold on it yet. I want to see them have a different capital strategy going forward. And I would want to be behind their capital strategy because currently I'm not. Yeah, fair point. Interesting take. Um, anything else in sort of the energy, utilities, oil and gas, sort of a lump of that those sectors all into one? Any other companies in there that? Uh... Um, yeah, utilities. I Well, utilities have been hit really hard recently. So that's definitely interesting me. I do own some utilities. Energy, not as much, though. Right. I, I don't personally feel like I am comfortable enough with the volatility of oil prices and how that affects these businesses profitability. Right. So over the long term, like I just, I just feel like I don't know enough about that sector to confidently invest in it. Yeah. So I, I avoid energy right now. Understandable. Understandable. Um, just full disclosure. I have, I do have a QN Algonquin power, but not a lot of it. So, mm -hmm. um, just leave that with that. <laughs> um, I'm going to jump to another sector, and it's kind of one of my favorites, um, both to invest in and to talk about. 
which is the Canadian uh, telecom sectors, the obviously Bell Canada, TELUS, uh, Rogers, and and now Quebec or so um, over this past year, uh, I've been really dollar cost averaging into uh, into Bell ticker symbol BCE, and I've been really really again on my watch list really eyeing Telus at like it's been fifty two week lows now for I don't know two maybe three months right so uh, yeah just jump in there give me your thoughts on on the on the telecoms. Yeah, I I don't own any sorry any telecoms at the moment. I did own Telus. I believe I was buying it near the end of 2020 when it was low. Well, actually, I think it was around the share price that it's currently at. Right. But um, I thought Telus was looking decently attractive back then, and then it went on that massive run up to thirty four dollars a share. I felt like it got a little bit. It, it was too much too soon for a telecom for me. So I did end up selling my TELUS position above 30. And now it is getting to that point where it could be looking interesting again for me. Yeah, definitely. But these telecoms have a lot of debt too. Yep. They they use a lot of debt. So in higher interest rates, I'm just not totally sold on how that's going to look quite yet. Yeah, it seems like every time they build out, like obviously the latest is 5G, they build out, they take on massive debt to build out this new 5G network. And then all of a sudden, now they have to build out a new network, whether it's six or seven or eight G or whatever is coming next, right? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I remember 20, maybe even 25, possibly 30 years ago when fiber optic cables and, and again, these companies, primarily Bell, were just laying out massive dollars in, in fiber optics. And it, it's very similar now with, with the, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, cellular and, and the mobility side of, they, you you have to keep upgrading to to stay current, and, and I agree with you 110 percent that yeah these companies operate with massive amounts of debt. Yeah, yeah. It was also interesting to watch because Telus, I believe, over the past couple of years went through a very large capex cycle, where they were spending billions on you know new infrastructure essentially. Right. And during those CapEx cycles, the business is actually losing money. It's spending more money than it can generate. But then while it's losing money, it's also paying a very large dividend. So how it's yeah. paying that dividend is it's actually taking on debt to pay the dividend, essentially. Yeah. And as an investor, I don't really like that. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I know. I get that 110%. Like, uh, I, I believe it was last January, Bell raised their dividend. And I had just started, uh, you know, buying into bell at that time in like last december and i was literally like are you sure you want to raise the dividend like maybe we could pay down some debt <laughs> but yeah yeah i agree <laughs> okay interesting take on the on the canadian telecoms i, I want to jump into uh, uh the united states of america uh u.s stocks and i'm sure you're quite familiar with a lot of them i don't know if you own any but please uh, let us know if you do but i'm kind of very curious of um uh, you know, the, the the popular names that you hear all the time, the Teslas, the Apples, the Microsofts, the Metas, uh, the Googles, the uh, Amazons, all of those, I guess that's primarily tech stocks. Um, and then there's so many other uh, great U.S. companies, uh, the Dividend Kings and D Dividend Aristocrats, the, the Home Depots, the McDonald's, the Coca-Colas, the Pepsis, the list just goes on and on and on and on with uh, incredible American companies. So uh, I'll, I'll let you take it from there. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I I don't own as many U.S. stocks as Canadian. I'm actually quite heavily invested in Canadian companies. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, someone would probably look at my portfolio and be like, yeah, you need some more diversification around the world there. But my justification is a lot of the companies that I own in Canada, like ATD, Constellation Software, even the banks, they have global businesses. Right. They have even uh, CP and CNR, they have business down in the US. They're a North American company. So just because they're on the Canadian exchange does not mean that I am not diversified in the US, in my opinion. But in terms of US tickers like Tesla and all those ones, I own a few. I own Google and Amazon in specific. And I was buying those ones quite heavily 
at the end of 2022, when the tech sell-off was really hitting those companies, right. I was I was loading into them as uh, as much as I could. But now after this run, I've sold out of my meta position. I bought that one around 100. I've sold out of that one. And Apple, I think, is too expensive for me to consider. Tesla, NVIDIA, those types of companies, I think, are way too expensive for my liking. Yeah. So I... NVIDIA I would, like, would have been... A you know, if you, if you bought it a year ago, you're looking like the smartest investor of all time, right? Yeah, exactly. But even McDonald's and Pepsi and Coke, well, those ones are coming down now. I would need to update their prices. But I remember looking at them about six months ago and just thinking like, you know, these companies are trading for 25, 30 times cash flow. That's more than Google. So they're priced at higher prices than a company like Google. And they're growing at, you know, a, a third of the speed. Yeah, yeah. So I thought that they got quite expensive as well. So I recently, I don't have anything like that in my portfolio. If they continued coming down, that might change. But at the moment, no, I don't really have too much US. Yeah, fair enough. And yeah, I'm the same sort of I have next to zero exposure in direct uh, US stocks, but obviously you have some exposure with, you know, owning owning banks or whatever else that, that might have uh, US or other global interests. I did I hear you correctly? Do you mention CN and CP? I did, yes. Have you ever seen my tweets of the train out that window? I have, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, um, you know, I, another fun, and again, um, I don't own either of those railroads, but I, I would love to. And it, it, again, it goes back to I, I can't buy everything. I just don't have enough money to buy everything, <laughs> yep. right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, incredible companies, extremely wide moats, um, you know, the backbone of the economy, so to speak, right? Like they're, they're moving goods east, east to west and even north to south now with, uh, with that new deal that, that CP has with, with Kansas City. So, um, yeah, incredible. Any, any further thoughts on, on the rails? Cause, and, and again, now Anthony is like, he's, he's going to be like your number one fan. <laughs> oh, you've, you've talked about Brookfield and the railroads. <laughs> Yeah, I think that Canadian railroads probably have, well, they're a duopoly. And I yeah. think that they have, let me think about that. I I would actually say that they have some, the strongest mode I have ever seen. Yeah. I think that CP in specific, after the Kansas deal, CP's total rail network now is probably the most valuable rail network in the entire world. And I yeah. don't think that there's going to be anyone that can disrupt their business for the next 200 years. It's like, right. it, it is ridiculous how, how wide those moats are. So they're both in my portfolio. Those are stocks that I just don't worry about at all. I know that in 50 years, there's a very high likelihood that they're still going to be around producing cash and returning it to their shareholders. So that's great for me. Yeah. Yeah. 110%. <laughs> I say it all the time when you mentioned like, oh, I, you know, the widest moats, uh, possible I, I say it all the time is like nobody's coming along and building another railroad out my window like those railroads are built nobody else says hey i've got a great idea i'm gonna build a railroad right like no the, yeah the rail lines are built and it's just now who owns them and and who do they lease them to right because obviously they lease to via rail or whoever else that might be on their on their network but you know that that's a, a major major component right like could you imagine trying to build a brand new rail line across Canada. No. <laughs> Can you think about how much land you would have to buy? Like all the yeah. politics involved, like, man, no, I just don't think they're going to be disrupted anytime soon. Here in Ontario, via rail has been talking for years about building a more direct line from Toronto to Ottawa. So it would run through like basically uh, follow highway seven, Peterborough, Perth and that, that route. Um, but again, they've been talking about it for years and nothing has happened. And that would just be like one, like Toronto to Ottawa is pretty in, insignificant amount of space in the grand scheme of how big of a country Canada is, right? But that's the only time I've ever heard of anyone um, talking about building an, a new a new railway. Yeah, over here in Calgary, they want to connect or they've been talking about connecting Edmonton and Calgary. And again, that's something that's been in discussion for probably a decade. And it's just... Yeah. It for passenger happens. rail, right, or or a high speed rail, so it would be uh, it would be more commuter friendly, right? Yes, yes, it would. Yeah, yeah. which would be good, right? It would, like, 
long term, if you're trying to get more cars off the road, you're trying to reduce the carbon footprint, all of uh, all of those, those fun topics. But at the end of the day, it's really, really hard to, uh, like I said, to build just decide to build a new railroad. <laughs> you're not many people want to, are going to do that. <laughs> no, no, I agree. So yeah, those companies, probably some of the most secure, or there's some of the companies that I feel most secure about in my portfolio. Yeah. And I, I understand that 110% for sure. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't see why you wouldn't, right? Like, yeah, yeah, rails are good. <laughs> <laughs> Since we're on the on the topic of uh, Canadian, and the reason I'm thinking this is because I see the containers on the rail cars, Canadian Tire. We don't talk about that very often here on the Passive Income Podcast. I'm guessing you've never made a video about Canadian Tire on your channel. Nope. And it's a very, in my opinion, we never talk about it on Twitter in, in the, in the uh, or X in the, you know, bin twit, div twit communities. But Canadian Tire is an incredible business that maybe deserves a little more love. What do you think? I actually have not taken a deep look into Canadian Tire, so I don't know. Like... In terms of me as a consumer, I like Canadian Tire. I go there. I actually don't go there very much, but whenever I need something, it's usually at Canadian Tire. Right. That's what I find. Yeah. And it's usually things that like you wouldn't buy off Amazon, like a lawnmower or something like that, you know? Yeah. So I definitely think Canadian Tire is a good business. I just don't know anything about their financials or how they're priced today. So I would have to I would have to take a look before giving a better opinion. Yeah. Understandable. And I'm kind of the same. Like I, I, I don't know a lot about the the financials and the business and the and the balance sheet and all of that part of Canadian Tire. But as a consumer, you're like, yeah, if, if I need tools, one of the first places I'm looking is Canadian Tire. And and I take it back to every Canadian kid who has ever played hockey has has gotten equipment from Canadian Tire, whether it's a hockey <laughs> stick or skates or gloves or a helmet or all of it. It's they've they've had something from Canadian Tire guaranteed. Every single kid that's played hockey in Canada guaranteed right so yeah that's that's definitely a strong canadian brand yeah so uh that was just an interesting aside i just happened to think of that because uh, like i said uh, i literally see the canadian tire containers on on the rail cars i see rail cars every single day i'm su actually surprised there hasn't been one passed by the window while we've been chatting um <laughs> <laughs> does that like keep you up is it loud Oh man, you get so used to it. You get so used to it that when the train rumbles by, you actually find it soothing and relaxing. It's like, yeah, it's it, it's 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 almost weird. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna bring up one more sector that I want to talk about, and then and then we're gonna get into talking about some of your uh, different things, your your stock unlock, your uh, Twitter page, your YouTube channel. Uh, but the final sector I kind of want to talk about, and I'm going to, well, I guess kind of maybe two sectors are going to lump it into, into one consumer staples and consumer discretionary. Uh, we've already kind of talked, touched on like the McDonald's and the Coca-Cola's I'm, I'm thinking other, uh, other companies here again, here in Canada, something like maybe a pizza pizza or a Rogers sugar, or, um, you know, there's so many other, the, you know, the A&W's, the, uh, um, sort of the list goes on, but. I guess just maybe give oh and the grocery stores too as co consumer staples right like the metros Loblaws uh, uh, Sobeys Empire exact uh, etc. So um, I, I'm big on the food industry because we all eat every single day right your stomach doesn't care if it's a bull market bear market recession your stomach doesn't care it just says feed me <laughs> so <laughs> yep I, I I guess what are your thoughts on on that sector or sectors Yeah I don't ever invest in well let me put this another way the only sector i invest in out of all of those would be the grocery sector and currently i own empire because i thought that it got pretty beaten down right it's a recent uh addition to the portfolio but yeah just in terms of how empire was priced versus all the other major canadian grocers it was like half the half the cost essentially on a yeah. per profit basis so i i bought some of those or bought some of empire Metro is one that I was very interested in. That stock has done incredible, but yeah, I added I added Metro to my watch list at like the 55, 56 dollar mark and now I'm like 
Oh. <laughs> yeah, there was there was a period, I think it was in like 2022 or something, where it, it hit $51 and I was looking at it like, I should buy this stock right now. Yeah. And, and I, I never did. now it's right around, what, 75-ish, give or take, somewhere in that yeah. range. Yeah. If I, I remember if I bought so yeah, that. Yeah, $20 per share over in less than two years, that's that's a, a amazing capital appreciation. Yeah, I was just about to say that if if I did buy that stock at that time, it would have been one of the best performers in my portfolio to date because it's been going up while the overall market hasn't really been doing anything. Right. But Empire has not been following. Empire is, uh, I don't know what's going on with that stock. It's kind of just staying low. Mm -hmm. But one thing that I've been thinking about more with grocers is there's a lot of political drama going on with them. Yeah. Yeah because the government is kind of trying to blame inflation on the grocers right now. So my well, they've had them called the, the CEOs of those three corporations that we've mentioned, they've been called to Ottawa twice now to, to try to explain their record break, breaking profits. Yep. So, yep. And then that, that kind of worries me as an investor because it kind of says that the government is going to put a cap on the margin potential of these businesses, which I don't really love. Yeah. As an investor, you don't love it. As a consumer going to the grocery store, hoping your grocery bill isn't like, yeah, <laughs> two or three or four hundred dollars. You're like, oh, I, I'm okay with them, kind of like maybe putting some caps on some of these prices. <laughs> so, yep, yep, that's that's true. As a consumer, it's a good thing. As an investor, I'm like, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's it's tough to walk that fine line between investor and consumer because, yeah, at the end of the day, as an investor, you want prices to go up and your or your shares to go up but as a consumer you're like i don't want to pay <laughs> so much for everything yeah exactly yep i agree <laughs> uh before we before we jump into some of your uh stuff like i said your website your twitter your, your youtube any other sectors or companies or businesses that you that you want to bring up or touch on no i don't think so no i think that was a really good overview actually awesome awesome so i'm going to bring up stock on lock first all right and i found this very interesting uh skimming to the bottom i believe it said it was you and a couple of your youtube subscribers <laughs> that that started this yeah this is a stock analysis and portfolio tracking tool that so, yeah that people love obviously right there it says people love us yep yep we have <laughs> five star five star five star great ones yep we have thousands of users all over the world now using stock and lock and it started, as you said, with yourself a, right there. Yep. A couple of engineers watching my YouTube videos, reaching out to me and basically starting a platform that we thought the main goal was in my own investing before stock and lock, I had subscriptions to probably five different investing platforms. And I thought that was kind of ridiculous. Right. So we built stock and lock to kind of just try and consolidate everything an investor needs in one place at also a really low cost. And, and yeah, it's been going great. We've got, again, thousands of paying users. We're growing all the time every month, and it's just been awesome. Uh, I'm just going to read this. Transforming everyday people into successful investors. Then I love this. We analyze and score over 170,000 global stocks and ETFs so you can save time and find better investments. So yeah, if, you, if you're looking for 170,000, let somebody else do the work for you and uh, check out stockonlock.com. <laughs> Uh, the link will be in the description below. <laughs> awesome. And yeah. then just, yeah, sorry, go ahead. I was just about to say, yeah, we, we cover 65 global exchanges. We actually had an email the other day from someone in Korea saying that they use Stock Unlock because they're the, or sorry, we're the only platform that has Korean stocks apparently. So oh, there's wow. a lot on there. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot on there. Wow, that is amazing. <laughs> and then uh, that should now have, Yes, your YouTube channel. Let's talk about uh, YouTube. 213,000 subscribers, which is absolutely amazing. Honestly, I was kind of hoping to see that silver play button in the background behind you. Oh, okay. The webcam must be a little bit cropped then because it's just out of frame. It's like right there. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's on that shelf. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, well, congratulations. That is a, a, an incredible milestone for anyone on YouTube to get that silver play button. And, and I guess, yeah, just let's talk about that YouTube journey, how, how it started out, um, how it's going. Um, 
what made you start making videos what makes you keep going because i know also it can be um difficult extremely difficult to stay motivated right yeah youtube is a lot of work i think i think it's more work than a lot of people realize yeah it is it is like a, another full-time job if not more yeah um yeah so i started out making youtube videos in about 2018 i actually did not start making youtube videos about investing and long-term investing you can't see the videos because they're taken down now but yeah yeah that's what i figured is like yeah you've just kind of left this one up here for fun by the looks of it and yeah. then here three years ago so 20 is when i you decided to to make that shift into uh uh, the more of an investing channel because i i have that too like old videos of just like snowboarding and fun exactly stuff that are all put on private now because for obvious reasons yeah exactly i have 1.6 million views on this one I asked me the other day you can see the red line there yeah um, that that was my best performing video ever yeah i actually clicked on popular videos and that's how the, that's why i watched that one because i was uh, <laughs> I, I was like obviously looking at your channel uh, before I talked to you. So, yeah, but uh, yeah, I started making investing videos in 2019, late 2019. And really how my YouTube channel started is I was just making content on a bunch of different things. Like I was even making video game content at one point and I was trying yeah. to just figure out what do I enjoy making and what do people actually click on? And then when I started, when I made my first investing videos, I noticed that, oh, they would get one to 3,000 views, which was crazy for me because my other videos would get like 50 to 100 views. Right. So that kind of showed me that it's either people want to watch investing or they like the way that I, I talk about it or a combination of the two. But there was a very clear indicator there from the market on YouTube that yep. make some investing videos. So I continued going down that path. And then the stock market crash of 2020 happened with... Um, we all know what happened. The COVID crash, as I like to call it. Yes. And when that happened, the COVID crash, I was just making videos on everything that was going on. And they like those videos were getting hundreds of thousands of views. Wow. And my vi my channel went from, I believe it was around 9,000 subscribers to 50,000 within a month. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So That's it, incredible growth, right? Yeah, I've never seen anything like that in my channel's history. Like to date, that was the most insane growth it's ever seen. Yeah, wow. So I kind of contributed to, I was in the right place at the right time. And I got a little bit lucky if I'm being totally honest, because yeah. <laughs> I was, again, I was just at the right place at the right time. Yeah, yeah. And it's just kind of, I've been riding that wave ever since. Well, just remember that saying, uh, luck is when hard work and preparation meet or so, I think it's something to that effect right so yeah it was a lot of hard work I was definitely <laughs> putting in the hours <laughs> and, and I love that you made that point too I quite often again going back to you know Twitter slash X where you see somebody saying here are seven passive income and they'll like list like dividends real estate renting and then they'll put YouTube in there and I'm like if you think YouTube is a passive income, you have never had a YouTube channel. <laughs> right? No, it is not passive at all. <laughs> I, I, the only minor argument there is like, okay, maybe a video from a year ago that's still getting some views, you might still be making a, a couple dollars on. But if you're not consistently putting out content, then those videos from a, from a year ago are probably not getting views because you've been lost in, in the YouTube uh, algorithm of history, right? Exactly. Yeah. On YouTube, it really rewards you for staying consistent and being consistent. Yeah. And yeah, honestly, that's something that I've been struggling with over the past few months with running stock and lock and investing in my portfolio and really trying to grow my business is staying consistent on YouTube has kind of become the third or fourth most important thing for me. Wow. So it's, uh, yeah. And I'm, I'm feeling it. I mean, my channel's yeah. not growing as much. My videos aren't getting as many views. But it is what it is. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's kind of a a beast that way because mm -hmm. even once you get big, or big re in relative terms, it's like if you do not continue pushing and if you do not continue yep. posting, it will be taken away. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I love that. So I, I, I guess I'm just curious now too. Between YouTube and Stock Unlock, are those like your full time jobs for full time income, or do you have 
other things that you do? I'm guessing you don't really work a nine to five at this point. You're just, uh, those are your, your two main income sources. And then anything else is, is uh, butter on the toast, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Stock Unlock is definitely my main focus now. It's my main income. It has replaced YouTube now. Um, obviously, my YouTube channel still gets some views. It still makes me money every month. I still post on there. But it's not, Stock Unlock has surpassed that now. So that's my focus. And then also, you know, I get dividend income. I have some I have some side investments. I have one real estate investment as well. So I have kind of a few different streams of income going on. But yeah, the focus right now is definitely Stock Unlock and growing the platform there. Uh, one final uh, page to share here, which is your uh, Twitter. You can find Daniel on Twitter slash X <laughs> at Pronk Daniel. Uh, P R O N K Daniel. Sorry, am I pronouncing that correctly? You sure are. Yep. And I see you're gonna have to update this. You have 212,000 <laughs> subscribers here, so th that needs to get updated. But uh, definitely give uh, Daniel a follow over there on uh, on the old Twitter. And yeah, uh, absolutely amazing having you here. Thank you so much for coming on and being a guest on the Passive Income Podcast. Truly appreciated uh, spending time with you i can't believe how quickly an hour has flown by 56 <laughs> minutes right now um before we sign off uh, any final thoughts any final words uh any words of wisdom anything that you uh you just want to get out there and say to anyone for about anything uh, i guess if you're thinking about investing or you haven't started yet just start you know just get on base that's my saying I, I my money ball reference just get on base right exactly. you know the movie money ball with brad pitt and, and jonah hill Yep. Just get on base. Just, just get, get on, on base. base. Get hit by a pitch. Bases on balls. Ground roll double. Single. Whatever. Just get on base. <laughs> yep. Just start. No matter how small it is, just get started. And yeah, that would be my main thing. And also, just to say thank you to you for the invite and having me on. It was a great time. I really appreciate it. And hopefully it's not the last time. No, yeah, I definitely would love to have you back. Uh, I would definitely love to have you on a uh, one of the live stream uh, roundtables. I would love doing that. I, I was trying to do that once a month, but honestly, I've fallen off since uh, since uh, midsummer in August, where I didn't get one done in August or in September, and haven't had one in in October yet either. But uh, the live panels are are awesome because you get you know myself and a few others, and we just sort of have a, a great discussion around, uh, like I say, around the table. So um, yeah, it would it sounds like it'd be fun for uh, us to do that with Anthony? <laughs> oh yeah, yes, it would. <laughs> there you go. Uh, New show idea. Perfect. Love it. <laughs> Definitely. So um, again, thank you so much for your time. Truly appreciate you being on. Definitely go and give uh, Daniel a follow on Twitter. Um, if you're not already, please go and subscribe to his YouTube channel. You will really enjoy the videos over there. And check out Stock Unlock. All the uh, all the uh, links in, in the description below. And yeah, perfect. If you're still here, 58 minutes later. See the one that says right there? Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. <laughs> awesome.